Good evening, Crystal. Hello. It's like you're by yourself right now. Where's everybody at? Don't know. I wonder if that Gavin kid knows that we meet twice a week. I gave him last week off because he didn't have to take that test, but we'll give him a second here to see if he shows up. Have you been reading any of that stuff or are you just relying on me to tell you at all? Both. Okay. That's some pretty good reading. Did you, you didn't buy the book, did you? No, I have it. Or you did buy the book? Did you buy a, a paper copy? No, my brother didn't borrow it. Oh, okay. Is it a paper copy or just a, a, online? A huh? Just a hardback. Oh yeah, it's a good book though. There's a lot, there's a lot in there. Yeah. Um, I tried to weed out what I put in the course. I tried to weed out the stuff that's like, eh, you probably don't need to know that, you know, and just try to just keep it pretty concise in the, in the okay. course itself. So, um, time is it? I don't want to let drag this out. We're going to talk about diesel fuel today. And um, let me uh, stop that share. Let me highlight me instead of you. There we go. Um, and we are going to get my computer in the right mode here. So we're going to, uh, let me just bring up a PowerPoint on some diesel fuel. And believe it or not, we could, uh, well, that's pretty odd. What did I just bring up? Let me try that again. Hmm. Let me find that PowerPoint. Bear with me here. Save that. How about that? That's a little better, huh? Come on. Okay. Well, since it's just <clears throat> since it's just the two of us, we'll go through this, and I won't keep you here forever. Um, but it's uh, but there's a lot of stuff involved with diesel fuel, and if we're talking about diesel engines, and and its whole its whole premise revolves around diesel, and so. Um, Diesel fuel is super critical. If we don't have a proper supply of it, we don't have a proper quality of it and everything like that. It just snowballs down to the, to affect every bit of how that engine idles, how it starts cold, how it, uh, all the emissions that it makes and how much uh, uh, power it makes. So it's, everything's really, really crucial as to what we have in the way of diesel fuel. So um, all of that stuff, all of all of those items are are, are just crucial to the uh, operation of the diesel engine. So you know one of the one of the starting points if we're going to diagnose an engine is we're going to find we're going to make sure that a we have enough fuel, we have enough quantity coming to the engine, and that we have good quality. It has to be not only good fuel, but it also has to be uh, free of debris, junk like that, water, um, and all that stuff. So we're going to kind of work our way through um, diesel fuel here today. Um, the low pressure, we're, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to get into the low pressure system here today. We're going to, I'm going to wait and, and do that on Monday, but the low pressure fuel system, you know, it's really responsible for getting the fuel, good, adequate, clean supply of fuel from the fuel tank up to the uh, high pressure fuel system. So we have, 
you know, we're going to talk about them. We have two different fuel systems inside of every diesel engine and uh, one to get the fuel up there and one to, once it's up there, it's going to be responsible for injecting the fuel and making the, making the diesel engine operate. Um, okay. So, um, when we say the word diesel fuel, it, it, there's a wide range of fuels that are available out there as opposed to gasoline. You know, usually with a gasoline engine, you know, you're going to have, you know, you can have maybe three grades of gasoline. Most of them will operate in, in anything. And then you might have some aviation fuels and stuff like that that have a high lead content. But for the most part, gasoline's pretty, you know, pretty simple. When we talk about diesel fuels, we have everything from a jet fuel, which is, you know, a jet's run on diesel fuel, but it's a, a super highly refined all the way to kerosene to uh, bunker fuels um, and all, all in between. And so we're going to try to talk about what those are, what their qualities are. Um, we have diesel fuel made from uh, petroleum, biological sources for our biodiesels. And then we can also make it out of, they make them out of gas. And we'll talk about not, not gasoline, but like um, vapor gases. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So early fuels, we talked about it yesterday. The first engine that he ever built was made, he, was, he injected coal dust in there. Uh, didn't work real well. But in 1900, up until about the 1920s, the thing that he sold his diesel engine on was, and the way the French wanted it so bad was because he ran it on a biological source, which was peanut oil. Okay. See if, if you have, if you're running this engine on peanut oil, it didn't, the, you know, the, you know, some of the French uh, um, colonies that they had didn't have oil available to them. You know, they didn't, they didn't have the oil industry available to them. So they needed an engine that they could run on with not having to get oil. And so um, peanut, they could grow peanuts and make um, peanut oil and then make a fuel oil out of that. And so they were able to use um, these diesel engines in uh, as generators and, and farm equipment and stuff like that in some of these remote locations that they couldn't get oil for a, for a petroleum based fuel. And they could use um, and these, these biodiesels at the time, but that's what this engine was originally designed on was biodiesel. Okay. And then in the, but it wasn't until the twenties that they figured out that it was um, when they were distilling crude oil to make gasoline. Well, would they, they have all this leftover stuff? Well, they figured out that they could use that in a diesel engine and use it really efficiently. So it became the, um, uh, it, it became the fuel of choice because it was super cheap to make because when you take a, a you know, a barrel of, of oil, crude oil and you start distilling it off and making gasoline and you got all this extra junk left over, what, they didn't know what they were going to do with all this extra junk. Okay, it was a byproduct that they were throwing away. Well, they started making diesel out of it and they started figuring out that they could do other things with it. And, uh, and so it was, um, that's how they ended up with uh, petrol diesel. Okay. And then, but then they started having problems um, because there was no standards. So they had diesel, you know, they were just throwing all kinds of crap out there as diesel fuel. So we had lots of emission problems, which in the old days, they really didn't care about emissions, but what they did have problems with was uh, high pressure fuel pump failures and engine failures because of poor quality diesels. There was no, no standardization as to what was going on out there. So that's when this uh, ASTM got involved and, and started. They actually were a different name in the beginning, but um, they came up with standards to say, okay, what are the standards that, you know, we're going to come up with, with diesel fuel so that everybody's got the same, um, you know, quality of diesel. So that way manufacturers can make, you know, engines and high pressure pumps and stuff like that to work the same from across, you know, party lines and they don't have to, um, um, you know, they can build it one way with one fuel and everybody's happy. Okay. So they've, they've addressed standards, uh, with biodiesels. They've addressed, uh, standards with, uh, um, fuel grades for regular pet petrol diesels. And they got one, number two, number four. We're going to talk about those in a little while here. Um, so don't get 
worried about that, but they just have different gradings that they have for diesel fuels. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but they use um, the high speed, more high speed diesels are going to use the thinner number one diesels and, and home heating oils and stuff like that are going to be uh, your number four diesels are big boats and stuff like that. It's called bunker fuel. And, um, and, and there is no number three designation, which I, I don't know why, but they didn't ask me. So that's the way it goes. Um, so how do they make diesel fuel? Where does it come from? Diesel fuel is when they, when they take, um, when a barrel of crude oil comes from, you know, Iran or Iraq or Alaska or wherever they get it from, Texas, they're going to take that barrel of oil and they start boiling it. Okay. And, and it's just like a, it's just like when they make um, whiskey, they're going to, they're going to take um, some sort of a grain alcohol and then they're going to boil it. And that's going to, as that, as the different, at different temperatures, different things start to evaporate. When they evaporate, they get collected in a, in a container and they run down and then they collect those. And that's how, um, that's how they get the different, they get, uh, butane, propane, um, uh, uh, gasoline, diesel fuel, kerosene, jet A fuel, all the way down at different, everything boils at a different point. Okay. And so at those different temperatures, they can get the different hydrocarbons out of that barrel of oil. And they call it, I think they call it cracking or, or frac fracturing out of the oil. Okay. So, um, just a picture of this, it really doesn't really matter, but different hydrocarbon chains, you know, methane, octane, cetane, they're just different hydrocarbon chains that make up uh, different kinds of fuels. Okay, so smaller, lighter hydrocarbon molecules boil, boil at a much lower point. So in other words, at a lower temperature, they're going to boil off. And then at higher temperatures, are your diesel fuels and stuff going to boil off? Okay, what that what that practically means is, is that the, is that the fuels and gases that, that uh, boil off at those lower temperatures, they're going to have a much less heat content in them, as opposed to the diesel fuels, which are, which are heavier, the heavier that fuel is, the more it takes to boil off, the more heat content that is. And what that, where that comes down to in a practical sense for you is that the reason we can get better fuel economy out of a diesel as opposed to a gas engine is because a gallon of diesel fuel has more heat energy in it than a gallon of gasoline. Okay. So, cause what we're trying to do when we fire off that cylinder is, is we're trying to get a, a, a good solid explosion in that cylinder to make, make power and push that piston down. If that fuel, I'm sorry, let me get your water. If that fuel has a lot of high energy in it, we don't need to have as much of it in there. Okay. Whereas if it doesn't have a lot of energy, we got to put more in. So that's where we get why a diesel engine has um, gets more gas mileage is because it has um, more heat content in its fuel than a um, gasoline engine does. And where that where that really equates to is is as that fuel is burning, as that cylinder is burning on the way down, we talked about this a little bit on Tuesday, gasoline burns really quick. And so like in the first third of the stroke, it's all burned out and done. It has burned all its energy up and it's, and it's done. Okay, so the rest of that stroke is just a waste of energy, waste of time. Where a diesel has more energy built in it and it takes longer for it to burn out. And then, so it burns all the way to the bottom of the stroke or, or more, you get more of the stroke with uh, power. So you, with all that extra heat energy, you get more power and you get better fuel economy. Okay. So here's just kind of a picture of uh, just an illustration of how they, you know, they they put crude oil in here, they heat it up and, and the different vapors are going to come out of this container at different levels because of the temperatures. Okay. So, you're going to have your uh, gasoline, kerosene, diesel, then your fuel oils. And then all the yuck at the bottom is your lubricating oils, your waxes, asphalt, you know. So they actually use every part of that barrel of oil for something. Um, but that's how, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, 
how they get what they get out of a barrel of crude oil. Um, so the other way that they make it, and, and this got invented back in the 20s, because Germany, okay, in the 20s would have been um, in the middle of early world, probably late World War I, early World War II, they were, you know, Germany was just a mess over there. And they didn't have access to a whole ton of, of oil, okay? So they came up with this, this dude, Fisher, whatever these, like Tropish, whatever his name is. They came up with this process. Sorry, I'm, I'm a mechanic. I'm not a speller or a reader. But they came up with this process where they can take, uh, uh, you know, coal, carbon monoxide, it, rotting, rotting gases, decomposing gases and plant matter and stuff like that. They take these methane gases and, and stuff, and they can then synthesize that and turn that into a diesel fuel. And, and, and it, and it's, so it's a, it's a diesel fuel derived from gases rather than from oil. Okay. And it works the same. It actually has the same, we end up with the same uh, hydrocarbon change. So we end up with the same heat content and everything. The, one of the great benefits of it is that it doesn't have any sulfur in it because there's no, because we get sulfur, the barrel of oil, depending on what part of the world we get it from, there's a lot of sulfur in there and we have problems with sulfur in our fuels. But in doing it this way, we don't have any sulfur in it. It's a more expensive process, but it is a process to where different parts of the world, they don't have access to oil. They have an act, they have actually have an access to be able to make diesel that works. Uh, Shell um, Oil Company actually has somewhere in um, Malaysia has a gigantic facility that makes diesel fuel out of out of this process. It's called gas to liquid, and uh, it's pretty uh, pretty useful worldwide. Um, I think it's a little bit more expensive than just distilling it out of a barrel of oil, but it is an answer because see um, they use a lot of um, natural gas to do this. In some parts of the world, natural gas is really plentiful. If you went into, I mean, that's one of the arguments uh, they'll probably be talking about tonight in the debate is the whole thing of fracking. Fracking has been a big issue. Is it good, bad, and different? Okay. But fracking makes it, makes the world be able to go down deep, crack that, that, that shale up underneath there and be able to get natural gas up out of the ground. That natural gas is naturally cleaner to burn than oil. It's, it's a very efficient uh, source of fuel and it, um, and they can turn that into many countries are turning that into diesel fuel through this gas to liquid process. So um, good, bad, or indifferent, that's what we're getting out of fracking and it's, and, and so, okay. Um, diesel, diesel fuel is typically cheaper than gasoline. That's always arguable because the, the oil companies know the demand of diesel fuel. And so they will raise the price of it, but it's cheap, cheaper to produce. However, with a lot of the standards that we put forth today, remember that, remember that diesels used to stink and were slobbery and gross messes. Well, we're, we're, we're cleaning the diesel up, but in order to clean the diesel up, we have to have these really clean diesel fuels. And so with some of the high standards and stuff, it's kind of raising the price up of the diesel fuel. So diesel is not necessarily that much cheaper than gasoline. Sometimes it's more expensive. It just depends on the supplies and the demands. Okay. So diesel fuel is going to come in a whole bunch of different colors. Um, you, typically, in today's world, if you've got really good diesel fuel coming out of a pump, it's going to come in a and it's going to come in a in an amber color, um, kind of like this one in the in the middle here, almost always. But you're going to find people that use diesel fuel out of tanks. You know, guy gets it out of the yard, whether it's a whether it's a, uh, a guy that works at a at a facility that has their own tank, or it's one of their work trucks. He's going to grab this fuel, and whether he's stealing it or he's allowed to. And some of that stuff sits in their tanks for a long time, okay? And so it gets really, it can become very dark and amber like the one on the right, okay? It gets a dark uh, color. Um, and when you, uh, we'll talk in a minute about it, but it will, it's, it, it starts to break down and has problems. And, and it ends up, when you pull the filters out, they're sticky 
and has has kind of lots of issues with it. Okay, but going back here to the slide before, some of the colored things that are out there is aviation fuels, which are going to be your jet fuels and stuff. They're going to be dyed blue. Okay, they're going to be dyed blue for for two reasons. A is so that they make sure that you're putting the right fuel in a in a jet, because we're, we're we'll talk about some of the properties of diesel fuel in a little bit here, but some of the things that are in there are some of the pore points and, and, and cloud points because of the waxes that are in there. If you have a really low or really high pore or pore point or cloud point, in other words, they start when they start to get cold, they'll start to gel because the waxes start to get really thick in there. Well, think about that jet. Do you want to be on that jet liner up there at 32,000 feet when it's minus 20 degrees and have the fuel start gelling up inside the, the fuel tanks? No. So you want to make sure they got the right fuel in there. Additionally, the red, the blue fuel that's there and then our off highway stuff like a, like if you had a tractor or a um, you know bulldozer or any of this equipment, any kind of equipment, um, that's going to get dyed red. Okay. So they tax those fuels at a different rate because they're not going to be on the highway. You don't pay a road tax for it. You pay just kind of some kind of a tax. Um, I think there's a kind of an example here that... Um, um, those are road taxes, uh, 88 cents, like 11 more cents a gallon for, um, uh, clear regular diesel, as opposed to the, the red diesel that you're going to get for off highway use. However, the taxes are way different here in California. It's, it's a lot cheaper to use the red diesel, but if you're caught with the red dyed diesel in your car, in your truck, and you're driving around with it, they fine you $10 a gallon which is, you know, if you had a 50 gallon tank, you know, which most, most people in cars driving around, it's not a big deal. They, they, they don't even check it and it's not that big a deal. But if you're a work truck, you know, and you buy, you know, if you got, you know, a fleet of trucks that are, that are doing service work and stuff like that, and they buy big gigantic tanks of red fuel for their tractors, and this guy just steals it and puts it in his truck and somebody finds it in there and he's got a, you know, He's got a 50 to 100 gallon tank in his truck at a, at $10 a gallon. They're going to, you know, if you had a hundred, if you had a 50 gallon tank, it would be a $500 fine. And it's, and then, and you got to get it out of there and getting that stuff out of there is not easy because it always continually colors the next fuel. So anyway, that's, that's the, the, the big thing you're going to find with, with fuels, you're going to find blues, which I, I personally have never seen a blue fuel because I've never seen jet fuel but you'll see red fuel all the time and you'll, people will steal it and, and take it. So on that subject, technically the red fuel and the clear fuel should be exactly the same fuel. Okay. It, it should make no difference, but um, depending on the yard that you're, you know, depending on the place that's got the red fuel, they could be buying their fuel from a source that's not ultra low. And we're going to talk about ultra low sulfur here in a second, but we have issues with these guys that, you know, you know, the guys who the, they put the power links up, you know, the big power lines and all that stuff out there. And they have these companies come in and these guys come from out of state and they're working at these companies and working on these big sites. Well, some of these big sites have gigantic fuel tanks for the, the drilling equipment, and all that stuff, well, they're they're getting cheap fuels that aren't ultra low because those equipment doesn't require the ultra low sulfur diesel. And these guys with their new trucks, they go in there and whether they have permission to get that fuel or not, and they're stealing it, it well, I can't tell you, but they're getting that fuel and putting it in their trucks. And so all of a sudden now they're all they've got uh, high sulfur fuel going through their engine and it's poisoning their after treatment systems. You know, and it's, you know, some of that, some of that after treatments to systems can cost, you know, somewhere between two and $6,000. And it's like, well, pretty, pretty, pretty dumb move. So, and we'll, we'll make sense. That'll make sense here in a minute, but all right. So this is a picture of, of on the left there, you'll see the, the clear diesel fuel that's normal. And then on the right hand side, it becomes uh, uh, cloudy when it, you know, it, picks up moisture, it picks up oxidation. It just, when it's old fuel, it's going to start looking, it's going to start looking like that. It'll still run. Most of it'll still run. A diesel engine is pretty forgiving. It'll run on a lot of garbage. It just won't run as well. Um, okay. So sulfur in diesel fuel. Sulfur naturally occurs in the crude oil. 
uh, and depending on where it comes from, some some uh, crude oils like coming out of Iran and Iraq and all those over there, that's some really, they call that sweet crude and it doesn't have a lot of sulfur in it. But the, some of the stuff that we're pulling out of uh, Texas and uh, I think Alaska is re has a really high sulfur content. Um, so they try to, they, they, they try to remove a lot of that sulfur out of the, out of the fuel. And then when I started in this business back in the, back in the eighties, uh, um, it was just diesel fuel and there was a lot of sulfur in there. Then in about 94, they, 1994, they made them go to low sulfur diesel. Well, when they started taking the sulfur out of it, I don't know the chemistries of it all, but we had lots of problems with older diesels couldn't run on it because they were, they were, their seals leaked. They had, we had lots of problems. We had to go back and fix a lot of vehicles to make them be able to run on the low sulfur diesel. Um, but as a, as a whole, having the diesel, having the sulfur out of the diesel fuel is a good thing, not only for emissions, but it's, but the sulfur's abrasive. It does all kinds of stuff to the, to the diesel fuel pumps and stuff like that. So it's, Good to have it out of there. So in 1994, they they took the diesel out. We went to at some point in there, we went to low sulfur diesel, and then um, and then we, that was probably with the introduction of some of the catalytic converters. And then in uh, 2010, we had to go to ultra low sulfur, which I think brought it down to 15 parts per million. I think it's in here somewhere. Um, Yeah, 15 parts per million. We so we went from 500 parts per million to 15 parts per million. And uh, and I don't even know if you can buy high sulfur fuel. I I know I I know they make it. The military uses it. Um, other countries use it, and and they use it for uh, you know off highway stuff. But but anything out of a pump, <clears throat> anything out of a pump these days, is um strictly ultra low. Um, so, and, and the reason they went to ultra low ultimately was because it, we got the, we have the digital or diesel particulate filters and catalytic converters and SCRs, all that exhaust stuff in there. If we have sulfur in the fuel, it, it contaminates all that stuff. Now we still have little bits of sulfur in there and still make it out. Um, and it is responsible for a lot of the particulates that come out the tailpipe, but we, um, we pretty much do our best to get that out of there. Okay, so some of the requirements that we're trying to make diesel fuel work because uh, it's because remember that a diesel re requires and diesel engine requires good diesel fuel to ignite because we don't have a spark trying to ignite it. So we have to have a good a fuel that is ignitable. Okay, so some of the things that we're trying to do here is is we're trying to start a diesel engine. So we need to at low temperatures we need it to be able to to start be able to start, you know, explode and start. Um, and then also after an engine started and it's really cold, we need it to be able to uh, burn and burn uh, effectively so that it's not, um, um, if it only partially burns, that's where we get the white smoke in the morning and all that kind of stuff. We need it to make sure. And, and when we get that white smoke going out, the white smoke is nothing but raw diesel fuel going out the tailpipe. Okay, so that's not good on the environment. It's not good on the exhaust. It's not good on anything. So we want to make sure that as as we as they as they formulate diesel fuels, we need to make sure that they um, um, work well in the engine when they're cold. Um, that they have the right properties uh, to be able to work at low pressures and temperatures. Okay. Now, having said that, if they work you're, you're trying to do a balance because if it works really good on a cold start and all that, that means it's burning really fast. That means you're going to lose power because you don't have the, the depth of the of, of thicker fuel. I mean, probably the easiest way to say that is a thin fuel to a thicker fuel. So they got to, they got to have a balance. The other, one of the other big properties of diesel fuel that we really have to worry about is it's lubricating values. Okay. All, and we're going to, we'll get into high pressure pumps and stuff next week, but all the, all the high pressure pumps and all that stuff, they don't run in, in engine oil, they run in diesel fuel. So you have all these high wear parts 
running in diesel fuel. And if the diesel fuel doesn't have a good lubricating value, then you're just, you're, you're running metal on metal and you have lots of problems. And, and we do have problems like that. People, when people put gasoline in their diesel engine and they accidentally put gas in there, gasoline has no lubrication value at all. So now you, you know, you're, you've taken all the lubricating value out of the, out of the diesel fuel and you have super small clearances and, and all this, and it tears up a fuel system. So it's important that the, that's one of the real big qualities of it is that it has, um, good lubricating value. Okay. Okay. It has, diesel fuel has to make power. Okay. But that's what I was saying. If it's too thin and, you know, too high of a cetane, it burns quickly and does really well in that cold engine. But then when the engine's hot and stuff, we don't have the, the power rating that we, that we would get out of an engine. So we got to make sure that there's uh, the oil, that the fuels has that balance so that it runs good cold and has lots of power hot. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about uh, gelling fuels here in a, in a minute. Um, fuel, fuels that take too long to burn will cause the engine to be noisy. Um, so we have, uh, you got to have those, all these properties involved. So I'll beat this up. Okay. We have to have um, fuels that are clean because if they, if they full of particulates and all kinds of stuff in there, we're going to plug fuel filters. If they've got lots of uh, gums and resins, that's why I talk about, um, you know, when the oil, when the fuel gets old, it starts getting gummy and resins build up in there and everything. And it, it just plugs filters up and it's just, it, you, it, if you ever take one off, they're sticky and they're gross and it's terrible. Okay. Uh, we need good fuels to promote fuel economy, lower emissions, but I want to talk about these flashpoints. So um, flash points, the temperature, at which fuel, when it's, when it's heated, will start to make a vapor. Okay. Um, and then it becomes unsafe. Gasoline boils at, we'll start, we'll start making a vapor. I don't know that it boils, but it makes a vapor at minus 40 degrees. So super, 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 super cold diesel or gasoline will make a vapor and you can light it with a match and burn it. Diesel fuel, on the other hand, doesn't start to um, uh, vaporize until about 100 to 125 degrees. So it's very stable. And that was the difference. Remember we talked about the, the French wanting to put the, the diesel engine in a submarine because gas engines were, the gasoline down there is, you know, super volatile, whereas diesel fuel is super safe and super stable. And, and I think I've got a, I got a slide here in a second. Um, Look at how, look at, this is the, this is a, 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 just a chart of flashpoints, minus 40 degrees down here for gasoline, jet fuels, you know, hundred degrees, regular number two diesels, you know, almost up here at 150 degrees, bunker fuel, which is your number four diesel, you know, almost 200 degrees. And then look at biodiesel, biodiesel is like, you know, pertinent near 300 degrees before it starts to become uh, before it vaporizes. So, you know, biodiesel is exceedingly safe fuel. Um, okay. And I was, I was just showing this to my wife last night at the gas station, you go to the gas station around the diesel pump and what do you see? Big gooey slobbery mess all the time, huh? Okay. That's because the gas, if you, if you spill gas out of the gas pump over here, it, it evaporates. As soon as, you, as soon as it hits the ground, it evaporates, might leave a little stain, but that's it. But if people spill diesel fuel on the ground, that diesel just sits there. It doesn't evaporate. It's going to sit there until somebody washes it off. And that's, that's the difference between gas and diesel in their volatility. Now, auto ignition point. This is, this is another very crucial point in, in diesel fuel. Um, the auto ignition point of uh, diesel is somewhere between 392 and 482 degrees. And the minimum, it's going to be 292 degrees. Okay, that's the that's the temperature in which if you heat it up, if you heat that diesel up, it it will just ignite. Okay. Gasoline, on the other hand, I think I wrote it down here. Gasoline doesn't ignite till five hundred and thirty six degrees. So gasoline has to be much hotter before it ignites. Okay. So even though 
even though gasoline starts to vaporize at minus 40 degrees, it doesn't auto ignite until a really high temperature as opposed to diesel fuel, which doesn't vaporize until it gets to about 100 degrees, but it won't auto ignite until 392 degrees. So it's much, much more stable fuel as far as that's concerned. And that's why when people accidentally put gasoline in their diesel engine, what happens is it is it doesn't burn as quick. And so it's got a delayed ignition. So you hear when you when you have gas in there, it you can hear it knocking and stuff because you have that late ignition and it makes it have a lower uh, cetane rating and it makes a, a lower ignition or a later ignition makes a noise, smoke and all that. But if you put diesel fuel in a gas engine accidentally, which it happens, people do, it, it lowers the octane in the gas and it causes it to pre-ignite. In other words, you're gonna, you, the, the, you're gonna pre-ignite that gas engine and you stand a lot better chance of damaging a gas engine with diesel than you do gas in a diesel because the diesel in the gas engine causes pre-ignition and it, and it will, it will actually, if you're driving it too much, it will actually melt pistons. I've seen that happen. So, but on the flip side, if you have that diesel in the gas or the gasoline in the diesel, you lose the lubricating value. You can, you can hurt your high pressure fuel system. So the bottom line is put gas in your gas engine, diesel in your diesel engine. Got it. All right. So uh, here's just, you can see there's a uh, uh, little thermometer at the, at the, these are the burning point or the, these are the, I'm sorry, the um, auto ignition points of diesel, gasoline, alcohol, propane, and natural gas. Okay. Uh, volatility, it talks about that's, we just talked about that. That's, uh, um, where it's going to vaporize. And that's where diesels don't need, where gasoline engines, if you, you have you been through an, a uh, 99 class with your brother or anything? No, but I don't think I have. Okay. Are, are you familiar with, with um, uh, evaporative emissions in a gas engine? Mm -mm. Okay. So, so in a car, like any car that you drive that has a gas engine in it, we have what we call evaporative emissions uh, systems because Gasoline evaporates, and when it, evapor it evaporates, if you if you leave a, a a cup of gasoline out in the driveway, it, in in an hour it'll be gone. It'll especially if it's a hot day, it'll just evaporate away. Okay, that's because it vaporizes at minus forty degrees. So the hotter it gets, the the more it evaporates. Okay, that that evaporates into hydrocarbons in the atmosphere. Okay, that's a problem. Those are just raw hydrocarbons in the air. Okay, that's one of the big emissions that that's a problem in our, that we're trying to deal with. So in a gas engine, they, we put a, uh, a gas cap on there. We, we seal the gas tank. We put it through a carbon canister. We do everything to trap that emissions from coming out of the gas tank because more, if you don't have, if you don't trap all that emissions coming out of the gas tank, you have more emissions coming out of the gas tank than you do going out the tailpipe because it's just the nature of gasoline. So they, so they kind of trap that and we, re, we trap them in a carbon canister and then we burn them in the engine. Well, a diesel, because a diesel doesn't uh, evaporate like that, it doesn't start boiling like that, it, it's very stable. So we don't, it doesn't require any kind of evaporative emission and we can just vent a diesel tank straight to atmosphere. And you can see right here, there's a little vent. If this was a gas engine, this vent hose right here would go to some kind of a device that would capture those vapors. In a diesel, they don't, you don't get any vapors out. So it's, it just vents. So it's not a, not a big deal. Okay. So now we're talking about pour point and cloud point. So when, they, when diesel fuel gets cold, it, the colder it gets, the, there's always a wax content in there. Okay. And that wax starts to gel and they, they call it fuel gelling. And it, so so as it gets, the colder it gets, it gets to a place where they call it cloud point and it gets to a place where it's, where the fuel starts to get a little bit cloudy. And I personally don't want to live in a place where I actually get to see that. I like living in Southern California where I don't really care about how cold the fuel gets because it never gets that cold here. But having said that, you could go to Big Bear and go skiing or something like that and get into some really cold wear air. And, and, and so it, this becomes an issue, but all those waxes become milky and everything. And, and 
and it becomes kind of a thick, kind of gets kind of thick. But then when it gets a little bit colder, it gets to what they call the pore point. Okay. And the pore point gets to a place where now nothing flows. Okay. And where it says here on the bottom, it says, then it'll, it'll plug up. Is it here? Is it on this page? Uh, somewhere in here it says, it says poor, it's most, most, some engines can still run at a, at a vehicle's cloud point, but all engines will not run at a poor point once it gets to that certain temperature. And this is a kind of a picture of that cloud point there, you know, the fuel gets kind of cloudy and stuff, but a poor point, it just plugs up and it will not operate anymore at all. You can't, it won't flow. Cause what happens when it gets to that cloud point, it gets in there, fuel gets in there and it plugs up the, the fuel filter and all that. So how do we get away from this is they're going to do a couple of things. They're going to put additives in the fuel to try to um, prevent that from happening. And they're also going to make, they're going to blend it with like uh, uh, jet fuel and stuff like that to make it, make it a little bit of thinner fuel. And when it's a little bit thinner, it has less of that wax content in it. Um, but what happens, so most of the time we don't see it too much in Southern California, but what, what they do is they have, when it starts to get, come winter time, they start the factories or the refineries start making a winter blend fuel. So it's going to have a thinner, it's going to have a higher cetane value and, and a little bit thinner fuel. And what's going to happen is people will start coming into the shop and saying, hey, I'm not getting the fuel economy that I once was getting. Well, that's because we've now run a different fuel blend that has le makes less power, but it runs better on cold weather. So um, just uh, know that that's out there. Um, okay, so let's talk a let's talk a little bit about biodiesels. Um, how are we doing time wise? Am I killing you? Are you bored stiff yet? Okay. No. So biodiesels. My son Garrett in his junior high school um, um, science or you know science class, he had to make a project. So he and I made made biodiesel. We we took vegetable oil and lye and all the stuff, and we were actually able to distill and make a make a viable. We made a gallon of viable diesel fuel. Didn't do anything with it, but we made it. Okay. But we didn't. I didn't have anything to put it in. <laughs> but we made it, and it you know it worked. Everything everything we did worked because what they uh, there's uh, I and I didn't. If you get in your book, if you really want to find out about, it, it's kind of interesting. But in your book, they talk about how they all the ins and outs of how they're, how they're making it, what they're, they have to put, you know, the, you can't just run. It's not just straight up, you know, peanut oil or vegetable oil or anything like that. There has to be certain esters and things like that, you know, molecule chains inside there so that it works and flows and does it. A diesel engine can, you know, there are systems that are out there that these guys put, you know, tanks in the back of their truck and they go buy use, uh, you know, vegetable oil from the Mexican restaurant, they pour it in there and, and they just run that stuff through there. And it's gross. I mean, that's all you could say about it. It's gross. They stink They're I've actually, I've actually had a, a truck come to my stall that when you, it wasn't running. And when you pulled the filter out, it was like, um, it was like lard. Have you, you know, like it was, it looked like lard inside there. Just, just disgusting. And, you know, cause it just, it solidified and, you know, you have to, you can, there's a guy that I think he finally sold a truck, but he was running around. There's a cyst, there's a, there's a, some hippies up in Northern California that sell these systems where that you, you could just run those kind of oils and stuff like that. And they run the heater hoses from the engine back there and they, they try to heat all that stuff up. And what you're supposed to do with them is start the car and run it on diesel fuel. And then you flip the switch and then your, your engine's running its heater hoses back and it's heating up this oil so that it flows. And then you flip the switch and then it runs and it runs this stuff through there. And then when you're done, you're supposed to, when you're going to stop the car, you're supposed to flick the switch and, and, and let it, let the diesel fuel flow back in there. And so that you're never running on that, trying to start and stop it on that, on that oil that it's really gross, but that's a side note, but biodiesels are made from, um, they're going to make them from a variety of things, but most of the time, if it's commercially done, they're going to use what's cheap. And it's usually going to be like soybean oil or, or one of those kinds of things. And uh, all they're doing is, 
is they're they're making um, some sort of a, a a blend of oils to make a um, a, a bio based bio based fuel. So you can have 100%, which would be B100, would be 100% uh, biodiesel. Um, the manufacturers are required now to make engines be able to run on B20, which would be a blend of 20% biodiesel and 80% uh, regular petrodiesel. And uh, the problem, well, I'll get into the problems with it here in a minute. But um, so one of the things, and it says it here, it's just, this is just makes it a comment, although it says it's under its advantages, but um, the biodiesel yields 3.24 units of energy for every one unit of biodiesel used for production. Okay, what the world does that mean? Well, think about it. When we're making, when we're taking a gallon or a 55 gallon drum of crude oil and we're gonna make uh, you know, gas and diesel and all that, well, it takes energy to heat that, a lot of energy to heat that barrel of oil up, okay? So you have, you have energy used to be able to make the energy we need, okay? So it's nothing's, nothing's free. You don't get, you don't go to get to go get a barrel of oil out of the ground and woo, we got a barrel of oil and we can make some fuel. It costs money to make that, okay? And that's the processing costs. Well, it takes a lot of energy to make biodiesel. So um, it's, it's they're showing it under an advantage here, but it really isn't an advantage. Okay. One of the benefits is, is, you know, it's from a renewable source. Um, you could argue whether, whether oil's renewable or whether it's going to be there forever or whatever. Um, but one of its really good things is that it is biodegradable. Um, it's not toxic. If it's spilled, it, I personally do not like the smell of it. I think it's very gross, but it is, technically safer. Uh, there's little or no way. I don't know why I said little or no, there is no sulfur content in it. Um, uh, it doesn't require any, in today's engines, it doesn't require any modifications to use. Um, it has better uh, lower hydrocarbons and CO and particulate matter uh, emissions. However, it does have higher NOx. Um, it, it has super good lubricating pro properties. Okay. And that's one of its problems too is that it lubricates almost too well and i'll we'll cover that here in a second um it has a high uh, cetane rating um it, it works pretty similar to um diesel fuel we'll get into some disadvantages of it here in a minute um it can be blended straight up with diesel fuel and, it, and they just blend together perfectly it's not like it's not like they're going to sit separate in a tank they blend up really well okay um, low sulfur content, uh, no aromatic content. Um, it has a higher oxygen content, um, makes it a little higher, uh, lower emission standards. Um, these are just redundant. We just talked about all these things. Um, interesting because the biodiesel is made from a vegetable or animal fat is comparable to table salt in toxicity and biodegrades as fast as sugar. Interesting. Um, See, and you're mixing your, you can improve your lubricity by 65%, okay? So just looking at the performance of it, it's, it's very clean. The, the, the green one, the brighter green is the, is the biodiesel. It's cleaner, got less carbon monoxide, less hydrocarbons, but your oxides of nitrogen are worse which, 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 when it all comes down to everything, the nitrogen, the, the NOx is the thing that we have the most problems with. So, um, so um, that's just redundant. Um, so the, some of the disadvantages, biodiesel is more expensive than petroleum to produce. Um, it's uh, the reason, and the reason that it's even out there is because it's subsidized by the government. It's subsidized by the government because somebody who's wanting to sell soybeans is pushing soybeans to the government so that they will can sell their soybeans. The same with why we have corn oil or corn in ethanol in our gasoline is because that's the first place that they go to is in the elections is, 
is Iowa and they have corn. And so there's a lot of politics involved with all of this. But at the end of the day, if it wasn't subsidized by the government, then it probably wouldn't, we probably wouldn't have any of it at all. But one of the other, one of the other um, um, disadvantages of it is the fact that the fuel, the distribution of it, it's, you can't even find it. I mean, it, it's hard to find because there's no, there's no gas stations that carry it. And, and so it, it's kind of, it, uh, that's kind of a big um, problem with it. Um, uh, and the energy input, it doesn't, it's not as hot as, um, I'm sorry, this, this is what they're talking about. It takes more energy, really a lot more energy to produce a, a gallon of uh, biodiesel than it does to make um, regular, I'm um, sorry, flip the page here, regular um, um, diesel fuel. So it's more expensive to make. If it wasn't subsidized, it wouldn't even, it, nobody would even think about buying it. Um, diesel fuel is an excellent solvent, okay? This is important. Diesel or biodiesel is an excellent solvent and leaves fuel systems cleaner. It, when it's a good biodiesel, it, it cleans the fuel system and it cleans everything out and it brings it all to the filters. And so we have problems with, with uh, failing gaskets and hoses and, and, and plugging filters and all kinds of things because it's such a really good solvent. So that is an important thing to think about with biodiesel and if you if somebody makes a decision to start using that in their in their engine um so you have uh like okay so here's a filters plugging upon switching if you so if you ran regular diesel for you know 50 60 000 miles and you said hey i'm going to start putting deep biodiesel in my vehicle well you know crud is built up inside that car whether it's in the tank in the fuel lines all the way to every piece of it and all of a sudden you're going to put this super good solvent through there it's going to clean everything up you're going to have you're going to you're going to suffer from plug filters and all kinds of problems right off the bat so uh the, the infrastructure thing we talked about you know the just the distri distribution of it is poor um and uh and um they have they still have lots of standardizing problems with biodiesels you know a lot of people trying to make it a lot of different ways trying to standardize you know what they are and how they are so it isn't a perfect world out there um the heat content is less so you don't get you you're going to lose probably 10 percent uh, uh drop in fuel economy which is which is you know not good it's it may be cheaper to buy but it you get less fuel economy. That's the same way with E85. Are you familiar with E85 in a gas, in gasoline? Go to a gas station that has E85. It's that flex fuel. You ever look at the back of a car, it says flex fuel. That's so you can run E85, which is an 85% ethanol. And it's, it, but ethanol, remember if we went back to that slide, it said alcohol, alcohol had, was, was a much higher, um, 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 burning point up there, which meant that it was, didn't have as much energy in it. Okay. So with less energy, you get worse fuel economy. So it's cheaper to buy, but you don't get the good fuel economy. So there's kind of that, you know, balance in there. Um, uh, biodiesel has a higher pour point. So it works. Um, uh, it, I'm sorry. I'm thinking backwards. It has a higher pour point. So it thickens quicker in cold weather. And so it's not as good in cold weather. It doesn't have a very good shelf life. Diesel fuel, petrol diesel will last longer on a shelf than, uh, than biodiesel. So it has to be used up. If you don't use it, it starts getting acids involved in it. Oxygen and water starts getting involved in there and it just becomes a big disaster. So you gotta be real careful with it. Um, can't keep it over six months. It likes to gel, uh, just lots of, um, if once, uh, this is an interesting point, I, and, and I had this actually happen to me once. Um, the, on the newer engines, we're, we're gonna talk about it, some of the emission things later, but we fire, we need, we need to put fuel in the exhaust to be able to clean the exhaust. To, in order to make that happen, we start squirting on the exhaust stroke, we, we put, um, fuel, we open the injector and spray some fuel so it goes in the exhaust, okay? And that's all fine and dandy. It's all designed to do that. But if you're running too high a content or too much uh, biodiesel in there, that biodiesel 
works its way through the rings and gets into the oil pan. And once it gets into the oil pan, it doesn't, it doesn't evaporate like uh, regular diesel fuel does. It, remember it had a really, really high evaporation point. So it sits in the oil. And what it does is it causes it to um, turn into a gel. And once it turns, once the oil turns into a gel, it no longer lubricates. And then it, 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 um, it can't pump it through the system and you end up with an engine failure. And, and I actually experienced this on a work truck. This guy was, was running that, running um, biodiesel and his engine came in and it was completely failed. No oil pressure. When we pulled it apart, the, the, it was just a, a thick, um, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It was, um, it was, a it was a, f almost like a, a foamy thick gel. And, the, and that's what the oil was. It was like, and at the time I had no idea what the heck it was. Something, something, I just knew something went radically wrong with this car, but, but it was because of this problem that it had, um, uh, oil too much, too much petrol or a biodiesel got past the rings and into the oil pan. And so it was a problem. Um, um, biodiesel attacks some of the additives in our engine oils. And so we have to be really careful that we make sure we change our oils and stuff when we're, when we're um, um, using biodiesels. Um, yeah, this, this last statement right here that um, instead of, instead of, like I said, squirting the injectors into the, uh, into the cylinder to make that happen, um, our Ford Transit uses this design where we put it, actually have an injector in the exhaust. We squirt fuel straight into the exhaust instead of doing it in the cylinders to solve that problem. All right. So, excuse me for one second. I got to turn a fan on because I'm going to die of heat in here. If I would just hurry up and get done with this, I'd probably be able to go outside and cool off. All right. So there's a lot of different kinds of um, types of fuels that are out there, whether it's for, for on the highway or off highway, agricultural, locomotives, vessels, uh, you, uh, you know, trains, um, all kinds of stuff. So um, there's different kinds of fuels for stationary engines as opposed to um, uh, on highway stuff. Uh, Think about, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it, and hospitals and stuff have giant uh, generator systems so that if, if the power goes out, the second the power goes out, that diesel engine starts up immediately and, and is full load in seconds, okay? So that the, so that the, the hospital, in a sense, never even notices that it, that it had a power outage. Um, so those engines have to be sitting there ready to go and have to have the right kinds of fuels to make that happen. Okay. So you have all that kind of stuff going on in this, in this diesel world. Okay. So we alluded to it before that there's um, uh, the classifications of diesel. So we have what they, they're using the term 1D, 2D and 4D. Well, um, you'll get to know them better if you went to like I think if you went to this the, to the station it's number one number two and number four diesel you will probably never see number one in your life um, I've never seen it it's we always use number two here um, and then number four is going to be for home heating oils uh, bunker fuels which are going to be your um, uh, fuels for boats and locomotives and stuff like that so what is that all about um, number one diesels are going to be thinner, less dense. They're going to, they're going to use them more in cold weather operations, but they'll also use them in high speed operations, uh, small light duty diesel high speeds in Europe. It's a very, it's the diesel of choice. Okay. As we think about it, D one or number one diesel is going to be less dense Okay, and remember if it's less dense, it's gonna have less energy content in it, right? Whereas number four is gonna be heavier and more viscous. And the because it's more viscous and more heavier, it's got more of the heavy waxes and the higher carbon content, 
it's going to have more energy available to it. Okay. So, so as you look at that on a scale, just remember, remember that, but we're going to be in our world, we're going to see number two diesel. Our number two diesel is going to be, it's going to have a minimum of a 40 cetane and up to maybe 55. I've never, I've never seen it that high, but it's usually going to be something, something I've always seen it something something greater than 46 uh, cetane. We'll talk about cetane here in a minute. Um, the number, so yeah, the number two is gonna give us a better fuel economy than the number one, remember, because it's got more heat content in it. So, um, lot, and there's just a lot that goes into getting the right mix in the blend. Um, the number four, they'll put into it can tolerated uh, by those in direct uh, indirect injected engines remember they had the, the they had the pre-cup and they it just a kind of a sloppy injector and you're you know those are big equipment you know trains boats and that kind of junk which if, if you're going to get involved with you just kind of need to know about it um it is not number four diesel is not allowed to be on the road. It's I think it's colored. I think it's dyed, but I don't know. I do know that uh, some of the fuel oils that they put in um, um, boats actually has to be heated in order to get it to flow. It's that thick. But, but keep in mind that the thicker that oil, that fuel oil is, the more heat it has available in that gallon of fuel, so they can get much greater power and economy out of that out of that fuel also keep in mind that when we talk about number four diesels it's not very refined it's not it's not very clean it's a messy dirty fuel and that's why they use it for home heating oils and stuff like that um, we talked about biodiesels at length we don't need to um, beat that up so I've alluded to uh, cetane numbers. Cetane, or what they call CN, those are, if, are you familiar with octane and gasoline? When you go to the gasoline pump, there's, you have 87, 89, and 91 octane, okay? Well, in diesel fuel, we have um, number two diesel, but number two diesel is gonna carry with it a, a cetane rating, which is gonna be somewhere around, is something, number two is gonna be somewhere above 40 and somewhere below 55 cetane, okay? And what those, what those numbers mean is octane, the higher the octane, the slower it burns. In other words, the more it's resistant to burning. Okay, remember with a, with a gas engine, we want to, we had the problem with, with higher compression ratios in uh, pre-detonation because the, the fuel would want to catch on fire before it got to top dead center because of the heat. So we have higher octane, which resists burning so that we can actually run those higher compression ratios. Remember, if we have a higher compression ratio, we can have more power. But the disadvantage, you've got to be able to compress that air fuel mixture in a gasoline. So you need a higher octane to be able to do that. Well, as opposed to the octane rating, a higher cetane rating means it takes uh, uh, less time to burn. Okay, a lower cetane, a 30, is going to uh, resist burning as opposed to a 50, 55. The higher the cetane rating, the higher it's, the faster it's going to burn. So it's completely opposite of octane. Okay, and so if we have a uh, really high octane or cetane rating, it's going to burn quickly, but we're going to have less power. But if we have a low number, it's, it's going to resist burning and it's going to have more power, but it's going, to, it's going to be harder to start when it's cold because it doesn't want to burn and it's going to smoke and all kinds of things. So there's that, there again is that balance. We want to, we want to hit that, that perfect balance so that this thing will start good and give us lots of power. But when we're talking about cetane rating, and this is important for you to know, is that a high cetane rating means it it's, it's uh, more ability to burn as opposed to an octane with a high number is its ability not to burn. Um, we just covered all that. Uh, 
So biodiesel is standardized, it usually comes in about a 47 cetane, and that's what you're really gonna see uh, number two as. I think, I've, I think we're gonna talk about it here in a second, but I brought home a cool tool. I was gonna bring home a, a bottle of diesel, but I won't have diesel on my game table. But this is nothing more than a hydrometer. And we're just going to, we're gonna just suck up some diesel fuel in here. And it's just going to, just like a battery hydrometer or a cooling hydrometer. It's, we're just gonna check the specific gravity of the diesel fuel in this, this little bulb inside here. Can you, if you can see that? There's a little thing inside there that's floating back and forth. It'll float in there and it'll, where the fuel level is, there's a number in there and you can take that number and know what your cetane value is. In, in all reality, in, in all practical senses in Southern California, because, of, because we're in California and they put such stringent standards on fuels, we have very little problem with fuel from the pump. Okay, so, so most of the time when somebody comes rolling into your, in your stall, you're really not going to have a cetane issue. Where we run into cetane issues is if somebody comes in from Mexico or they're pulling fuel from, um, you know, a, a tank someplace, who knows where it, who knows how long it's been sitting there. Or we can get some stuff coming out of Texas and stuff where they don't have the standards and you can get some pretty cruddy stuff coming in. So we have the tool. I haven't, I haven't pulled that thing out of the, it's probably been 10 years since I pulled that out of the cabinet, but it, but it is there and we can, we can use it if we, you know, if we have a problem and, you know, and, and if we do have a problem with low cetane, you know how to fix it, drain it out and put some new in. I mean, it's pretty simple. <clears throat> it's not a, you know, it's not something we're going to try to treat. Now there's additives out there and you're going to always will be asked this question. Because Ford sells these additives and they, you know, they have them on the shelf at the dealership and they say, Hey, you know, I can, I, they got these cetane boosters and we can, you know, I can, I can get my, you know, I, it'll raise my cetane to, you know, 55 or 60. Why wouldn't I I'll test you on this? Why wouldn't we want to raise our cetane to 55 or 60? What, what, remember what is, if we're going if, to, if to raise that cetane, we're going to make it thinner. We're going to take it from a number one to an, or number two to a number one diesel. We're going to make it thinner. What's the disadvantages of having a th too thin of a fuel? Will it burn too quickly? Yes, it'll burn too quickly. We'll lose the, the heat value of the fuel. And so you'll lose, you'll lose power you'll lose fuel economy, okay? So the reason we sell that cetane stuff is because in, in, you know, in Texas and Arizona and Montana, they might sell a cheap fuel that's got a very low uh, cetane value. If it was like at 40 and it was 20 to, you know, zero degrees outside, and the thing's having trouble starting, well, sure, you put that, splend that stuff in there, I'm going to raise your cetane value up to 46, 47 and make it so that it's actually a fuel that'll start and run cold and, and work for you. Okay. But if you don't need it and you just put it in there, you're going to, you're going to get the disadvantage of losing fuel economy and power because it's too high a value. Very good. You passed. Um, so just as a, a fun little note, um, those, those big, operating machines with the bunker fuels, the number four, those can operate with fuels as low as 20 cetane. Okay. That's just a super low burning thick oil that just takes forever to burn inside that cylinder. And it gets just get gobs and gods of power out of them. That's, and that's the, you know, and that's what, that's what they use them for. Um, I think we talked about that. Okay, so water and diesel fuel is a real big problem. Okay, and, it, and what will happen with water and diesel fuel is, is the is the water diesel fuel, especially biodiesel, is naturally hydro hygros, hygroscopic, which means it will absorb water. Okay, um, it will absorb some water or it will separate, but it's but it's very. Um, detrimental to the engine. Okay. Too much water in there causes things to rust. 
coagulate, have all kinds of different kinds of problems, especially when it's cold and stuff like that. So we, we do our best to condition it. We'll, we'll talk next week about low pressure systems in our fuel conditioning modules, where we're trying to condition that fuel before it gets to the pump is that we're trying to get the water and stuff out of it, trying to separate any moisture out of it. We don't have a lot of problems with it here in California. Um, we used to, um, but uh, they, they do a pretty good job of filtering it at the pumps when you buy the fuel. But uh, we still on occasion will have, what will happen is, is a, a diesel fuel tank. If you just had diesel fuel, um, stored it will grow microorganisms and algae al actual algae like you find in a river actually algae grows in a dies in diesel okay and it's a problem we have and we have biocides which is a it's a poisons that kill um that inside of fuels we we can add to it but um we don't have a ton of problems with it but but they do and and so you'll end up with all this uh, algae and stuff growing in the tanks and water and all kinds of crud so when when the dude comes to fill up the tank at the gas station, he drops that thing on the top, turns the pump on, and he just pours all this fuel in there and he stirs up all that stuff that's sitting in the bottom of that diesel tank. And he gets done, drives away, and Joe Blow comes pulling up to the pump and he starts putting that stuff in his in his truck. It it, it is not not as common as it used to be, but it's not it wasn't uncommon to have that guy just get a full load of garbage in his tank. Okay. So they've tried to do, they've tried to filter all that stuff better at the gas stations to try to make that better, but um, it still can be a problem. But, but also guys are storing fuel, you know, in, on their work site, drop sites and stuff, and they're pulling, getting garbage out of there and putting it straight into their cars. And it's, it's terrible because you're going to get, you know, depending on how that fuel's being stored, there's rust in those tanks, you get chunks of rust up, you get water, you get algae, you get dirt. All that stuff is really, really hard on a, on a fuel system. So, um, so maintaining uh, uh, fuel systems, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into to the low pressure systems. Um, uh, you can, they, they've, got, they've got places that you can actually have fuel analyzed if you've got a problem with it or something like that but it's usually the price, same price to just dump that fuel and get new fuel. So it's not, it's not that big a deal. If you got a, if you think you got a problem, you know, we can test it with the cetane. We can test it um, for moisture. If we got problems with it and we think we, we need to get rid of it, we need to get rid of it. Um, some of the things that we have, um, like I said, we could check this specific gravity. I've got the little tester here and uh, there's a good picture of one that just, it just floats and you can see it, that API index right there. It'll tell you right where the number is and there's charts to be able to see it. Um, if, if the fuel becomes stale, um, turns, you know, it starts turning orange in color and stuff. We know that it's stale and it need, you know, they need to burn it out of there or get rid of it. Um, it plugs up filters. Uh, it, it hurts. It makes it hard start. They smoke all kinds of things. It'll lose power. Um, Biodiesels, um, like I said earlier, they dilute engine oil, so you got to be really careful about making sure you're on top of your oil changes. Um, thinking of that's that big a deal. Um, we talked about that. We talked about that. We talked about that. So that's done. So just in a practical note, some some of the big things that we have when it comes to diesel fuel mm -hmm. is is the, the two the two biggies are uh, people real common filling their uh, diesels full of gasoline and they always they always come in and they blame it on their wife but we know better that they did it themselves and uh, and so we can we can you know one of the first things we do when we got a bad run in diesel is always take a fuel sample because you could go, you could spend hours trying to diagnose what's going on with this car to find out that it's got gasoline in it. And it's usually, unless it's just a little bit of gas, you can usually tell right away. You put it in your hand, the, um, and, and as, it, as it all kind of evaporates off your hand, you'll smell it and you can smell the gasoline on your hand, okay? Or, or you can just smell it in the, in the, you know, you can smell gasoline. But you can usually, you can usually tell that way. 
So that's a big problem. Um, do we have a lot of problems from it? No, we usually just drain it out of there, change it, charge them a lot of money and, and bleed it out. And they usually, I, I've never seen any long-term effects from somebody having gas in there. Um, the other thing that's a real big problem is uh, the diesel exhaust fluid. Are you familiar with diesel exhaust fluid? Okay, well, we will talk about diesel exhaust fluid in two or three weeks, but it is, it is nothing more than um, it's water and urea, uh, clarified urea, in a, and we put it in the, into a tank and then it injects into the exhaust for to clean up the exhaust. Well, people will pour that in, the, in their diesel fuel because the two filler necks are right next to each other. And so they'll, you know, again, the guy will say his wife did it, but he did it and he, and they pour, you know, and, and they'll usually, they'll, sometimes they'll fill it up, you know, put five gallons in there. But most of the time they're like, I just put a gallon in, you know, and then I realized what I did and I stopped and I didn't even turn the car on. Well, all they got to do is cycle the key to on to move it. And it's the electric pumps are going to pump that stuff straight in. And it's, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll show you what this stuff does in the future here, but it's, it's a, it's not just water, it's urea. So you have water, urea, and diesel fuel all trying to do something together. And it turns into this, I don't know, red, amberish, weird yakma that, that um, is very difficult to get out of the car. And we get, you know, we, sometimes we get it out and doesn't hurt anything. Um, but probably 10% of the time, we're, we're putting a six, $7,000 fuel system in the vehicle because they they contaminate it with this stuff because once that once that stuff gets in there you got this crystallizing weird stuff getting inside the uh, inside the pump and these injectors and and these injectors are piezoelectric crystals that run in fuel and they can't handle that in them and so um but those are really the big things that we see when we talk about problems with diesel fuel itself and I don't mean to bore you to death for an hour and a half or wherever long. It's only been an hour and 20 minutes about diesel fuel, but, but, but it is an important thing for you to know. And now you've got all this information that you will never forget and, and you'll be able to use it. Um, and and it, helps, it helps you be able to understand when you're trying to diagnose what's going on with this thing. How does this diesel fuel work? Okay. So I don't have anything more tonight. Um, yeah. Um, so what if someone wants to go from diesel to biodiesel? If they wanted to just start doing it? Yeah. Like, well, do they, you have to like mix, mix it or something or what? Well, okay. So, so biodiesel is going to come, you're usually going to get it one of three ways. You're going to get B5, which is biodiesel, 5% biodiesel, 95% regular diesel. Okay. You buy that. You'll find, a, you'll find that at the pump at places. And our 6.4, our 6 our six liter, were designed to be able to run on that, okay? The 6.7, which was introduced in 2011, was mandated that it had to be able to use B20, which is 20% diesel and 80% um, um, 20 bio and 80% uh, petrol. So with that blend, um, you can buy at a pump. You can't buy 100% biodiesel at a pump. It's not, it's not commercially available. However, you can't, but it, but it is available. You, can, you could get it, okay? Um, so if a person wanted to just, they said, hey, I want to just start using, um, you know, the station down the street from me just started carrying B20. I want to use that. It's cheaper or whatever. They can just start using it. I mean, they don't have to do anything. They can just go to the pump and start using it. Now, having said that, one of the one of the properties we talked about with biodiesel is it's got a very high solvent content, so it it really cleans things out. So if this guy's got you know fifty sixty thousand miles on it, he starts you know putting a, a biodiesel, any blend of biodiesel in his in his tank, it's going to start cleaning things out. It's going to start cleaning all the crud out, and it's going to where's all that crud's going to end up in the first filter or in the second filter, or anything beyond that is going to end up in the pump. So he just needs to be aware that, you know, usually the filters are going to take care of it, but he's probably going to have to uh, change his filters after a few hours, you know, after several hours of using it, he's going to need to change those filters just so that it, you know, he gets that stuff out of there. Um, 
could he just go to a from from diesel to a 100% um, um, bio source? Could I don't? There's no guarantee. The engine wasn't designed to run on 100% biodiesel, but I don't think it would be a problem. And it, you know, because where, where you run into problems with the the 100% biodiesel is is you got some you know hippie that's trying to sell you know his biodiesel or to somebody or wants to do it himself and try to make something. And so he's making something, try to run it in his car. And he, man, it's, it, you know, depending on you spent a fortune buying this truck and you're going to put something strange in your car. It's not real smart, <clears throat> but could it handle it? Probably, you know, but is it a guarantee? I, I would be, I would be leery of it. You know, and especially when a fuel system's you know six seven thousand dollars to change, it's a it's pretty big gamble. So, mm -hmm. what about uh, last last class? You mentioned about the noise a diesel engine makes. Mm -hmm. Not why why it does that? Okay, so that cracking noise that it makes that's because as when we talk about diesel's cetane rating. Remember, it's it's higher the number, the higher it's the more it wants to burn. Okay, the lower the number, the less it wants to burn. So when we inject, when so when when that piston comes up and it's hot, and we've we've created that heat, and we're ready to inject that fuel. Okay, if that fuel just goes in and just burns really quick, it doesn't make any noise. It just it just catches fire. It, the, the, the flame propagates across the piston and everything's happy. But where we get the noise is that when we have fuel that's, that's resistant to burn it's because it's a lower cetane, which is okay, what happens is it goes in there and that maybe some of the, some of the vapors may start on fire or something, but that, that droplets of fuel or that, that slug of fuel is resistant to burn, resistant to burn, and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and it finally burns, and it, it becomes a very violent, um, uncontrolled explosion for a moment in time. And that, that explosion is what we hear, that crack, you know, when that diesel crack, especially on a cold, you know, I got a guy that, I got a guy that lives right below me out here, and he starts his diesel in the mornings right next to my bedroom window, and, and that cold engine cracks really hard because because that cold that cold engine that fuels delayed burning because it's colder and it takes more time more time and then it finally blows up and burns and that's where you get that crack from that that is what the crack is and that's why when you put gasoline when a gasoline gets added to a diesel engine that that the gasoline naturally takes longer to burn it it's remember it's got that higher flash point or that higher not flash point higher um what's it called? Um, auto ignite point. It's a later auto ignite point. And so it, it's delayed, it's delayed. And then once it does, it's boom, you have a, a more violent explosion because of that auto delay. And, and we'll get into, when we get into the Huey injectors, we're going to talk about a little bit, how, how are they trying to get rid of that noise? Because one of the things that's always been objectionable about a diesel is that exact noise that it makes. But what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to do what they they're going to inject a little bit of fuel in the beginning, and start a small flame going across that piston, and then open up and let the rest of the fuel in. And now you've already got a flame happening there, and you put the fuel in on top of it, and it's going to just burn and not have a delay. And so so that helps quiet injection. And like I said, you can stand next to a six point seven or a, a three liter diesel. You don't even know they're running. They're so quiet. And that's because we've eliminated that ignition delay through pilot injection and, and how we do the, the, the injection. So most diesel fuel has a lower C10 rating. Well, not most diesel fuel. I mean, our diesel fuels in California are going to run about 46. Um, you're going to actually, they're going to be higher than that. I, I misspoke that you're, they're going to, the lowest I've ever seen is 46, but you're, you're going to have them up into 50. Okay. You're, they're going to be pretty, pretty high ratings here in California. Okay. And when it's in wintertime, you're going to run even a higher cetane rate value 
because they want it to be able to burn in that colder weather. Um, but you, I've never seen them as low as 40, but the minimum for, for number two diesel is 40. So you're going to see somewhere between 40 and 55 C tank. Was that high? 55 is high. Yeah. I've never seen, I've never seen it as high as 55, but um, we don't see the winter blends around here. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. I haven't checked. I haven't checked fuel in a long time because it just don't, like I said, we just don't have a lot of problems with it yeah. in, in California. Um, our fuels are, our, our fuels are really nice. If you, if you pull them out of there, like I saw that, that in that picture of the fuel, that one in the center, kind of a, just kind of a, a, a gold, kind of a golden color, clear golden color. It's, you know, very, you know, very good fuels. So So you're going to get into aviation. You're when you're you're playing with aviation, but that's all gas engine, right? Yeah, well, there's also jet fuel too. Well, yeah. that's for like the turbines. I I if I had to live in a different world, I think it would I would I would kind of pursue trying to figure out how a jet engine works because I don't understand it. Um, it's kind of a cool it's kind of a cool concept, the whole jet uh, you know like turbine engines and stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, which is a bunch of turbines and compressors. Yeah, I, but I don't understand how it works. <laughs> That's what are I'm you, learning right now. Are you, are you doing? Are you are you learning that right now? Yeah, I'm actually taking the taking my turbines class right now. That is really cool. Yeah, and it's just it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. But yeah. but with that knowledge, Crystal, with that knowledge, um, not only can you play with airplanes and stuff like that, but but you know you could get a job at solar turbines, you know, yeah. they yeah, are, absolutely. and they're all stationary, gigantic, big turbines. That is, uh, that is just way cool. Uh, that is, I mean, study hard and do well. And I, I hope, what, I hope what I'm sharing with you is, will help you in your endeavors in life. Oh yeah, it will. Of course it so, is. So anyway, um, I got nothing else. We'll talk next week. We'll, we'll, we're going to get into uh, low pressure fuel systems and then we'll get into the Huey systems and then into, um, 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 yeah, common rail fuel systems and then see if we have, hopefully we'll have enough time in this semester to get all of it in. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Thank we you. We'll see you next Tuesday. Okay. Have a good night. You too.